Good morning. Welcome to New Center Maine's Political Brew. We are back from our summer vacation and glad to be. This week's analysts are Democratic activist Betsy Sweet and former Yarmouth Town Councilor and Republican State Senator Phil Harriman. Good to see you both. Yes, good to see you, Pat. Good to see you. Hi, happy summer. Good End of summer. <laughs> yeah. But we're back to work. It's Labor Day weekend and that's when politics really that's ramp right. up. <laughs> Let's start with a little catching up on a little bit of the summer season campaigning that we missed and a story that broke while we were off. Republican candidate for Governor Paul LePage threatened to deck a Democratic operative. Six feet away or I'm going to deck. Now, this is a tracker, they call it. That opponents use them all the time. Nobody likes them, but they go around trying to catch somebody saying something that maybe they shouldn't say. Does this kind of moment, that little flash of anger, Phil, hurt Paul LePage's effort to show that he's a changed man since leaving office, or is it just red meat for his people? Probably a little bit of both. Uh, uh, certainly we'll see that uh, again in a, in a commercial, but uh, let's remember if Paul LePage, or for that matter, Governor Mills, was in office, you wouldn't get that close to the governor. There's a security team that prevents that sort of up close and personal uh, contact. Uh, Paul LePage says that his tires have been knifed, his car has been keyed, he's been through uh, quite a bit. But uh, nonetheless, if you want to get through this campaign, you cannot have these explosions that turn into uh, a news story. We're going to see if he can uh, deliver his Paul LePage 2.0 coming it's, up. It's not that hard to get under his skin. Yeah. No, and I mean, and this is politics today. I mean, do we wish it didn't happen? Absolutely. But this is true for everyone. I mean, you've campaigned, I've campaigned nationally. There were people following us every, my car was keyed. I mean, just, it's what happens. And, and, and I think it, what it does is it triggers people's memories of way worse stuff that he said. And so I think it makes it much harder for him to say, no, 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 I'm different, I'm, I've changed. It's much harder this way because the slightest thing is gonna trigger people's memories of the last eight years. When I married my late husband, who was a widower, I took on his beautiful daughters as my own. The chaos of raising five girls while working full time didn't exactly prepare me to govern during turbulent times, but it helped. As the summer season draws to a close, the TV ads have begun in the race for governor and the second congressional district. I'm just I'm curious, Betsy, I'm sure you've seen some of them. Is anybody connecting with their messaging and does it even matter really because we know these candidates this year so well? I think no and no. <laughs> I mean, I don't think, I think these commercials are way off base. I mean, I think it's interesting to see that both LePage and Mills are trying to make themselves more human, right? Trying to make, you know, see them with their families or with, you know, people. I think that's, and that's, you know, good human interest, summertime stuff. I think the Jared Golden commercial of him with a lobster just misses the mark completely. Like to me, unusual. to me, it's like, okay, this is like the classic Washington consultant thinking they're connecting with Mainers by having a lobster in the picture, where those of us who live in Maine are like, you're in a diner eating, taking apart a twelve ninety nine a pound lobster and you know, trashing it, like what? <laughs> Rather joylessly, in fact. Most people are happy to eat a lobster. Happy, right? and, but, and, and, it, and it, if the message is to working class Mainers, that totally misses the mark, I think. Phil, anything grab you? Well, yes, I think you know, the, the fact that they get to tell the story in their own way uh, rather than their opponent is always a good opportunity to reintroduce yourself to the voters. But let's remember, during the pandemic, we had thousands of people move into the state of Maine who know nothing about these candidates, and this is their opportunity to introduce themselves to new Mainers and hopefully get their vote. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, also happening uh, while we were off, uh, the Maine Supreme Court said part of the anti-CMP corridor referendum may violate the constitutional rights of the utility and the company that's building the project, the NEC. EC. At issue is whether laws can be retroactively applied to a project that's already had substantial work completed. And this apparent win for CMP, though, may have come too late to salvage the project. Phil, what do you make of it? Well, that's going to be the next phase of the court decision making. Uh, did they forfeit their right? But I, I have to compliment the Maine Supreme Court for affirming that it is not legal or constitutional for us to retroactively go back and change laws that people legally abided by. Well, and I think that what's interesting is I think all the legal stuff is going to be moot pretty soon because this will be held up in court for another year, right? And so at some point, the people in Massachusetts who are getting this are going to say, uh, yeah, we're out because we needed this like three years ago. I also think it's going to give incredible juice 
to the referendum that's going to be on this year's ballot that says, let's take over CMP, because the people who are anti-corridor, which is most of the people in Maine who voted for that referendum, are going to be angry that their will was overtaken and that CMP continues to do this thing. So I think it's going to give a lot of juice to the our power referendum. Well, this past week, President Biden delivered an unusual primetime address warning that Donald Trump's dominance of the Republican Party is a threat to the nation. The president said election deniers and, quote, MAGA Republicans are attacking American values. Betsy, who's the target audience for this? I mean, the Donald Trump supporters, I don't think, are going to be moved. No. So what's the point? I think the point was, first of all, I think he really feels it. I do think Joe Biden cares very much about democracy, and I think that's hurts him. But I think the target audience is all the people who feel like they're going to sit out the midterms. People who feel like, oh, I'm not so interested in the candidates, I'm sick of politics, I'm, you know, I don't like any of them, fi on both your houses. I think this is to say to people, oh, no, no, this is not about candidates, this is not about issues, this is about democracy. And I don't think he's wrong. I see it very differently, Pat. This was the person who said, vote for me because I'm a, a uniter and I'm a healer. And he used this sacred location to deliver a pretty angry speech and basically said to 74 or 5 million Americans who voted for Donald Trump, you're the problem. Did he not separate out just some well, kinds of Republican I voters? I think he did. I think he separated out people a lot. And he was very clear to say this is not all Republicans. This is those people who are really attacking the foundations of our democracy. Well, to that extent, I would suggest they are very minute, small percentage. But it was also an opportunity, I would add, Pat, that he was able to direct his anger and his power at a, another political party and not talk about the problems that he's had to face between the border and Afghanistan, and I could go on and on. Well, we'll see how the reaction plays out. Unfolding story that has a lot more layers to go, but more than 100 classified documents were found by the FBI at the Florida home of former President Donald Trump. And the Justice Department this past week suggested that efforts were made to move and hide some of those documents, which raises questions of obstruction of justice. Uh, Betsy, a couple of things here. What should happen next? What do you think will happen next here? Well, I think the story is really disturbing. Like his, Trump's lawyers tried to say it's like an overdue library book. And that would be one thing if no one had ever asked them. But this had been a consistent over and over, you need to return the documents, you need to get them back, right? So, and, and they refused. So this is obstruction of justice for whatever reason. Um, and so what should happen, if it was you or me that we did this, we'd be in jail. What will happen? I don't think much of anything will happen in terms of uh, its consequences for him, except that I think, I mean, they'll get the documents back. Obviously, they've got them back now. I think there'll be potentially political fallout, but I don't think that, I don't think Garland is going to go after him. And the, the notion of indicting a former president is political dynamite. Oh, for, for sure. And they've already set it up as that's what they want to do. So if Betsy's right, it's going to be portrayed as we went after this guy to get these documents and uh, alleged he was engaged in criminal behavior, but we're not going to enforce our, our law. Um, that's got pretty significant implications. And I think it also speaks to what role does a former president have to possess documents while he or she uh, was in office, which is also going to look, have us look at um, past presidents, whoever they are, what kind of documents do they have that perhaps they shouldn't? I'm pretty sure we'd find that zero past presidents have taken top secret classified documents and moved them to their private home. And a lot of them. That, that, yeah. a, lot, yeah. a lot of observers have said that's a lot of top secret documents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not right. like one that slipped yeah, like, in oh, with God, the other. This is my folder. It shouldn't yeah. have been. No. And, um, right. and then so I won't give them back. Let's, let's let the rule of law play out. Keep an open mind and yeah. see. Because clearly uh, the Justice Department says there's something there. Okay, well, do your job and let us see what you have. And if our motto is no one is above the law, we'll see. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> Portland voters are going to decide on five new ordinances and nine charter changes in November. There's a group called Enough is Enough, which includes some former elected city officials that are opposing all of them. Phil, could all of these proposals be terrible ideas? Is it smart politics if you oppose many of them to say, nope, kill them all? The short answer is no. This, that's a lot for the voter to absorb in one uh, election cycle. But I, I think what is, is emerging here is that the other side is using their uh, knowledge of how to run and work the system to create this impression that these are just reasonable ordinances and, and charter changes that in fact will have, when implemented, a lot of difficulty to be adjusted. And I think that's what enough is enough is trying to say is 
be careful what you vote for here because this is not easily changed if it doesn't work. And Betsy, Portland's a unique case. There's been a lot of legislating by referendum going on with some pretty strong stuff, the minimum wage issues and, yeah. and so on. Yeah, I think referendums are the voice of people who feel they're unheard. But I think we have to remember that this charter commission that's put this stuff forward, it was elected by the people. The members were elected by the people. They had every single one of their meetings was held in public with opportunity for public comment. It's not like it was like the secret back thing that didn't happen and now. So, so this is very much the democratic process. It's been very transparent. And I think it's hard to say, I mean, it, you know, to say that, no, just forget the whole thing. There's been a ton of effort gone into that. People have had ample opportunity to be involved. And I think that, you know, that's, it's, it's a little bit throwing the baby out with the bathwater. President Biden has proposed student loan forgiveness of up to $20,000 for some Americans. Uh, there are some who say perhaps this is not legal and we might find out how that plays out. But Betsy, is this good policy or just a political ploy by someone looking to get more voters to vote Democrat in the uh, midterms? Well, I think you have to look at the impact that this level of student debt has, has had on our economy and on young people. It's a $49 billion problem and, you know, and it affects low income people of color most. And it is a huge detriment to them and to our economy. And so as someone with three daughters whose debt would be wiped out by this, um, who all got Pell Grants, this is a huge boon. And I don't think it's just politics. Um, I wish he had done it a long time ago so it didn't look like it was politics, right? Because, but this is something he campaigned on. Biden said, I will eliminate student debt, the whole, all of it. That was his campaign promise. So I think um, I, as we look at it and, and you look at what we're doing and the one thing that I think hasn't been talked about that's important is going forward it doesn't allow the compounding of interest. So it's not like you could have borrowed $30,000 and 20 years later you owe $90,000. So that's a really important piece because that's just about the federal government making money off of you. Um, and I think the other piece is that it can't be more than 5% of your um, disposable income. I think those are as important as the debt forgiveness. Phil? I think this is uh, very indicative of why the president didn't address this issue in his uh, national address. It's not playing well on Main Street, and there's a feeling out there that people who chose not to go into debt or people who were uh, more frugal or paid their loans back are feeling like, so you're going to be forgiven your debt and you're going to transfer it to me to pay for it. I don't think that's playing well on Main Street. Uh, I, I'm reading different polls than you are because I think that people are seeing that. When, I'm not a diabetic, but when they put a cap on insulin, I don't say, well, I got nothing with that. I'm, that's your problem. You, you can't manage your diabetes well. That's your, I mean, that's not who we are. That's, and, and I know that I paid a lot of student debt. I'm thrilled that young people or, or people, many older people who only went to school for one or two years and dropped out who are 60 and 70 still have debt. I am thrilled that that's going to be taken care well, of. Well, but I, I think there's a distinction here that you go into this willingly. I, I borrowed a lot of money. I paid it all back. It was hard to, mm -hmm. to do I that agree. with raising a young family. I think that's the piece that the president is missing is that by osmosis, transferring that responsibility to people who didn't willingly go in and borrow money. And it doesn't address the rising costs of a college education. Which, that's the most which is the piece. most important This right. kind of encourages colleges. Right, so, exactly. so we'll see how that plays out as yeah. well. Uh, we'll wrap up with our winners and losers in politics this week. Betsy, we'll start with you. So my winner is Alaska and ranked choice voting, where it worked out exactly as, as it is intended, which is the person with the most support of most of the people ended up being the winner. The Democrat. The de it happened to be the Democrat. Um, but I, so that is thrilling to see it work out in that way. Um, and I think the loser for me is as school starts, the loser to me is all the people who are organizing to pressure school boards and individual teachers and harass teachers to take books off the shelves, to uh, comment on teachers' room decorations, to say that they're, you know, they're too nice, they're too compassionate, they're too, you know, we're not a family in this classroom. I mean, those, the people who are doing that are the losers, and the students and the teachers are the ones who are losing out. Phil? Uh, my loser this week is, unfortunately, President Biden's national address was an angry speech that took uh, about half of American citizens to task for being the problem or a threat to democracy. Uh, my winner this week is the Maine Judicial Supreme Court who affirmed that uh, it's not constitutional to retroactively change laws to undo things that uh, legal process gave them. Phil Harriman, Betsy Sweet, thank you as always. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next time on Political Brew. New Center Maine is back after this.